Welcome back to Mr. Latham's AP Macroeconomics. Today we're going to talk about the supply and demand for money and kind of putting it to the curve, kind of the basics, just getting us started. Okay, first of all, the supply of money, you can see it looks like this in the graph. The Federal Reserve controls the supply of money. They get to decide how much is going to be issued, what the banks can do. They make all the decisions. Although the Federal Reserve is the initial issuer of money, banks actually create most of the money through lending out the money, which we'll get into in a little bit. Okay, just for now, let's just understand that the Federal Reserve controls the supply of money, even though they use the banks to create most of it. And the supply is vertical because the Fed gets to decide how much there is. They don't have to worry about interest rates or anything like that. They can simply issue as much or as little money as they want to. Moving on to the demand for money. Okay, there's two different types of demands for money. Transaction demand and the demand for money is assets. First, transaction demand. What do we primarily use money for? We use it to buy stuff. That's the medium of exchange. Well, how much do we buy? Well, we buy GDP. So the bigger the GDP is, the more money we need. If you think back 100 years ago, there wasn't all that much money in circulation because GDP wasn't that big. Well, now GDP is huge. We have lots more money. So nominal GDP not doesn't need to be adjusted because dollars are nominal, right? If you hand somebody a seven-year-old dollar, they don't sit there and say, well, that dollar is worth $1.50. I'll give you extra credit. They don't, okay? it's So nominal GDP determines the total uh, transaction demand. And as you think about it for yourself, it's like how much money do you need in your checking account? Well, for me, I need a month's worth of bills, right? Because I get my money, I get a month paycheck, and then I spend it, you know, with all the various types of bills. So all of that money I need for transactions. I can't, you know, take that money and invest it or do something else with it. I need it there and available. The, and the demand for transaction varies directly with nominal GDP. In other words, what's happened to the demand for transa money for, for transactions as GDP's grown? It's also grown. Okay? So the primary mover of the demand for money for transactions is changes in GDP. Asset demand for money. Money is also used as a store of value. I can hold money and not use it. Why would I do that? Well, if interest rates were super low, I don't need to invest my money because I'm not going to earn hardly anything on it anyway. And so I can hold a bunch of money in my checking account. Let's say I need $5,000 a month to pay my bills. <coughs> Excuse me. I could... I could have another 10000 in my checking account that's just sitting there. Well, why would I do that? Well, if I had it, if I invested it, I wouldn't really earn any interest. But with when I'm holding it, if something comes up, if I need money for any reason, well, it didn't cost me hardly anything to do that. And I'll have the money where I have quick access to it and I can do what I, what I want to. Conversely, if interest rates are very high, well, I'm not going to have very much, I'm not going to want to have very much money in my checking account. Because, uh, you know, I want to earn that high interest. So if interest rates were 10%, I'd take that extra $10,000. I'd put it in to some type of an interest earning investment. And I would, and so I wouldn't have as, as ready access to it. So right here, key point, demand for assets varies inversely to uh, the interest rate. And we're going to illustrate that on a curve. Okay, now the total demand for money, you have to add up the two. So add up the demand for transactions, GDP, right? The demand for asset, which is the extra money I hold just because interest rates are where they are. And you get the total demand for money, okay? D sub M. What's that look like? Well, here's your demand for transactions, Okay, it's a fixed amount based on GDP. Now, obviously, it's going to change over time, but at any point in time, GDP is a certain size. We need a certain amount of M1, which is our spending money. It's currency plus checkable deposits or demand deposits. 
We need a certain amount to pay our bills. That's our demand for money as a transaction. In addition, right now, interest rates are very low. So we have a low interest rate. And right here, you can see it's nominal interest rates. So let's put that low interest rate. And you can see we have a high demand to hold money. So lots of people have money sitting in their checking account. Now, further down the road, interest rates were to rise, then the demand for people to hold money as an asset will go down because instead they're going to have it, they're going to invest it somewhere where they can earn interest. Well, when you add up these two graphs, you end up getting the demand for money, which is right here. You can see it's got this gap well, that gaps the demand for transactions, right? So that's how we illustrate that. And ultimately, we're going to see that we're going to have to combine supply and demand to figure out the interest rate. But here's your demand for money, and it's a combination of the demand for transactions and the demand to hold money as an asset. Here's where we get the interest rate. Combine the supply of money with the demand for money, and you get an interest rate. And by the way, this is the nominal interest rate, not the real interest rate. And we'll get into that later too, but it's when we talk about the supply of money, it's the nominal interest rate. So you can see the Fed gets to determine the nominal interest rate by looking at the demand for money and adjusting the supply for, of money as it sees fit. Who cares? Well, ultimately, interest rates, if you continue on, <coughs> come over here to the real interest rate and how much investments are demanded, right? Remember, if we want to build a factory, it costs lots of money. We need to borrow that money. And so the higher the interest rates are, the less the investment. So as the Fed impacts the nominal interest rate, it's going to affect the real interest rate, which is going to play into the investment demand. Why does that matter? Well, here we go. We have interest rates which adjust I sub G, which is the investment demand, which adjusts as aggregate de demand, and aggregate demand has a direct impact on GDP. That's why we care. That's why we are going to do this work on the supply and demand for money. So that's an introduction to our money supply curve, and we will see you next time.